Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, well, good afternoon really, but it feels like the evening. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the opening plenary of our Praxis virtual workshop on transforming conflict and displacement through arts and humanities. I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce you to Praxis and our aims, and then I'll hand you over, over to Robin Gill-Leslie, who will introduce you to our very illustrious panel of, of speakers. Today is particularly auspicious, as it's not only the International Day of Tolerance, but also marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. In light of this, we're particularly thrilled to have colleagues joining us from the UK's National Commission for UNESCO. Commemorating these kinds of events fits really well with Praxis's aims. Praxis exists to champion the distinctive contribution that arts and humanities research can make to tackling urgent development challenges. Funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, our role is to bring together and learn from AHRC's Global Challenges Research Fund portfolio, with a view to amplifying their impact and policy re relevance. Our first Nexus workshop brought together projects particularly focused on cultural heritage, was held under very different circumstances in Lebanon in February. We plan to hold another Nexus event next summer to focus on GCRF global health projects. And we also hold a lot of one-off events, um, some of which you may have heard of, uh, with various different partners, DCMS, British Council, also UNESCO. This virtual Nexus workshop focuses on conflict and displacement and has been structured around seven cross-cutting themes that we hope will generate fruitful discussions on areas that have been identified as relevant, relevant both to the essence of the projects as well as to current and pressing issues and topics of our time. Uh, so these themes include decolonial perspectives, movement and change, which focuses on issues around displacement of people, innovation or challenging orthodoxy. Uh, and next week, we, we explore intervention to development, arts as method, self-reflexivity, and recognising and addressing unintended, unintended consequences. Before handing you over to Robin, uh, to in introduce our panel, I wanted to draw your attention to the poem I've put up here, Abstractions by Sujata Bhatt. I won't read it, but I wanted to note just a couple of things from it. First, at the very top of the poem, the lost boys of Sudan reject the label they're given. This resonates with the ethos of many of the projects we're bringing together, an attempt to avoid labeling research participants and their experiences, uh, and instead to recognize their agency through the, throughout the research process, through adopting co-creative and co-productive approaches. Um, and the other really powerful image that I particularly like um, is about the imagination being the forest and the lake. And I really wanted to steal this for our event and extend it to express our hope for the discussions over the next two weeks. The forest and the lake are places of nurture and inspiration and at times of challenge and shadow. We hope the space created by this virtual workshop will allow everyone's ideas to take flight. Thank you for joining us to explore this creative space today. Please come back um, and join us over the next two weeks. You can contact one of the Praxis team if you want to find out more. Um, you can also find out more via the website and access different sessions via the website. Now I'll hand over to Robin and our speakers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I second Esther's warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I am delighted to introduce our panel to you this evening, all of whom demonstrate an impressive depth and breadth of experience in arts-based research and activism. Our first speaker is Asma Khalifa, a Libyan women's rights and peace activist who co-founded the Tamasir Women's Movement, a think tank and campaign group that researches, reports and advocates on intersectional, intersectional gender issues amongst indigenous groups. Currently, this organization is working on documenting everyday experiences of sexual and gender-based violence in Libya. Asma is also working with the Khalifa Elai Institute, investigating the links between culinary tradition, community cohesion and identity formation. 
In 2016, Asma was awarded the Luxembourg Peace Prize during the World Peace Forum, and the following year was named one of the 100 most influential young Africans. So a warm welcome to you, Asma. Our Thank second you so speaker. Much. Our second speaker is Ruth Daniel, the CEO of In Place of War, a global organization that uses creativity in places of conflict as a tool for positive change in the most marginalized communities. Under Ruth's direction, In Place of War enables grassroots change makers in music, theater, and across the arts to transform a culture of violence and suffering into hope, opportunity, and freedom. This evening, Ruth is joined by Teresa Bean, who leads on research activities at In Place of War. Building on her postgraduate studies and field work with In Place of War, Teresa's research interests include arts-based social movements, in particular hip-hop in Colombia, the role of community arts-based education in sites of conflict, and arts-based peace building. In addition to this, she has played a key role in developing In Place of War's education programs. And finally, joining us is Associate Professor Neelam Breda, who is an Associate Professor of Design and Development at Middlesex University. Her research interests include conflict, security, peace building, material cultures, gender, and livelihoods generation. Neelam works mainly in South Asia with a focus on Kashmir, where she has conducted primary research over the last two decades, both in Indian and Pakistan administered Kashmir. Neelam's work seeks to foreground voices of vulnerable and marginalized women within fragile conflict affected areas. Her work explores notions of healing, trauma, peace, and reflection through embodied practices of making, using material culture as the underpinning for approaching violence and peace building for sustainable income generation that in turn can contribute towards socioeconomic reconstruction and post-conflict development. I'm thrilled to welcome you all here. And without further ado, I will hand the podium over to Asma. Thank you so much, Robin, and sorry for rushing. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone, uh, or afternoon and morning, depending uh, where you are from. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be joining you today to uh, discuss um, um, reflecting on the themes, as, as mentioned by uh, by Esther. I, um, when I was given, uh, when I was asked to think about it, I, I, I was um, as often when you are an activist, a lot of the time you do not um, sit, you do not really have so much time to sit and think of what you are about to do. It's mostly a lot of ideas and then you need to move quickly to implement or you are applying uh, for funding or in many of the times it's actually not funded and it's volunteer voluntary basis, but it's like a great idea. You want to do it. It sounds good. You speak to several people. Um, and I would start with the design, uh, whether it's a workshop or a campaign, or an advocacy campaign. And um, the way I begin is, is by reflecting about actually my position in the process. So it's um, in workshops, I often uh, include participatory research um, sec sections of the workshop where I uh, conduct questions um in ways sometimes of games in ways sometimes of um role playing for the participants to share their knowledge with me so when i i approach it i approach the teaching learning experience it's often it's not just for them to be receiving information it's for me also to learn but it's a joint learning experience um, and especially when working with women, where a lot of the time, especially in Libya, we are very severely under documented in terms of the work we do, the everyday life experiences, especially after the war. So it was important for me that at the workshop, they also recognize their experiences, their projects, their works. It's not just in the introduction but in the gathering of information about their opinions about certain things, I always ask them to, uh, to give, or sometimes I ask certain participants to actually give an entire se session from her experience on a, on a certain topic. Um, and that's, that's something that um, I don't have to publish, uh, to publish it. I don't have to write about it, but, when I go back and write a report or write an, or write notes, it's it's uh, it gives me so much um, wealth of context for also the next workshop where I would think 
well, how can I make the participant um, in this learning experience um, also very much, you know, um, not on the receiving end, but how can they actually be in control in part of the process? And that comes from my um, conscious way of thinking um, and learning about how the learning experience in itself is also a Bauer relation, right? It's it's someone who has knowledge supposedly uh, with people who don't or have little or have, you know, in that specific area you're teaching. And uh, how can I not have that hierarchy? Because a lot of the time I'm training other activists. I consider colleague, even if they are younger, sometimes they're senior, sometimes um, um, our experiences are different in, in the fields. So how can this, um, how can this process be, well, created by both of us? And that, and then that made me also very much, um, approaching the same way when it comes to proposals. So when I, I uh, either be approached or I approach international organizations, I always, uh, try to put my foot in that we have to be involved in designing of the proposal. Um, why, where does rationale come for this? Why has a donor picked? And sometimes I understand that the donor or governments have a set sort of, uh, goals or, or a topic that they want to work on, uh, such as, you know, working on elections in the middle of a civil war. It's baffling, but sometimes they do. And I try to <laughs> ask these, I try to be um, uh, well, try to be positively cr critical. I'm not sure if I am perceived that way, but I try to ask questions on why am I not included in assessing my needs and why does a needs assessment, if it's conducted at all, needs to take two year to three years in a very fluid conflict that changes us throughout this time. It changes our needs, it changes our approaches. Um, and that is uh, that is in in um that is a, uh, in a way a, a very much still a, I would say a colonial approach to uh, implementing developmental projects, especially in conflict areas or in developing countries, where um, it's we are approached as implementers. We implement this idea. Someone else has thought about it. Someone else has rationalized it. Um, and I have. I've been trying and also through advocacy to to uh, try to disrupt this, to ask um, stakeholders and people who are interested in helping civil society um, to approach us to consult in from the beginning till the end, because it's important that the ownership of resolving issues are ours and not someone else's. Uh, because no matter how good you do at implementing someone else's idea, it's not your agenda. And the main core, I would say, as an activist, to continue to have that burning fire, to continue to work, is a conviction that this is your home, and this is your problem, and this is your community, and you need to work within it. It doesn't have to be a small scope. It can be the entire world that you are interested, invested in, but there has to be some self-reflection about our roles too. And I know that there is this um, insistence on being objective and being neutral, and which I, in my opinion, I think unrealistic. If you are vested and interested in a cause or if you're connected to an issue, it's, it's good to try to attempt to be objective but if you're working on issues of violations of human rights or of peace building or conflict resolution, being objective sometimes is is not possible in the faces of the things that you learn or the things you work with. So it's being, I sometimes call it being multi-party. You are with a lot of people rather than <laughs> detached from the process. Um, so, and that's also, I think, very much connected to the sustainability of development. How can we make development not just a response to a war or an immigration crisis or an internal displacement? How can sustainable, how can development be a continuous developing process? And that is true, um, not just 
you know, doing capacity building for organizations or activists or giving sometimes even resources, but it's through engaging them throughout all the way up to decision making, putting them through to speak to policymakers, to ministers at other levels, including them in other processes. I don't understand sometimes where you where some some projects aim to create young leaders and train them over the years or give them all these skills and tools. And then they are never at any table where they might influence a decision maker. And I'm like, but, but that's part of the sustainability. How do you how is your project successful if you've just trained people or if you've just told them that it's something that you could do if you gave them a skill? Um, and I and when sometimes I speak to to young people about these things, they often tell me that this is very discouraging that a lot of people would actually drop out from being active because they think it's not serious. They think that they fill a number in a workshop or they fill a number at a conference and that their presence is not authentic, that this is they're not it's not theirs. Um, so in in some of the research projects that I'm engaged in, I try all the time to bring in young researchers or those interested in research they don't have to have that much experience beyond they want to do that work where i try to help them in that process to get the skills and a little bit of experience to be able to do that and that is extremely unpopular for a lot of people because you want the job to be done professionally and implicably and you know <laughs> a glossy very perfect text but for me, if I would have an, an, an international expert or some other expert who would give me a perfect glossy text, it's not at all the same as giving people um, with their agency and their desire to do the work and experience to continue to do it and opening the door for younger people to be able to enter the fields that they are interested in through the work. So it's it's um it's a struggle some organizations agree with me others don't and um they, and then they would go to someone else but i i always try to you know <laughs> put my foot down on it and i would be like if you want this um research done on this issue that is very much sometimes youth related or youth focused you need to involve them you need to bring them in bring them as assistants bring them to just transcribe interviews give them a few workshops to do that, and then give them the experience. Most importantly, pay them. I understand volunteering is important as a spirit in itself, but you can't live on just volunteering. And volunteering should be done, decided by you and not by an international organization. If you want to volunteer at a shelter or whatever cause you're interested in, that's fine on your own time. But if you ask to come and do something for free, then it's, you know, <laughs> not at, I don't think that is at all um, as something that we should should continue doing with young people. Um, and lastly, I will talk about the two uh, campaigns that now we're working on, or two projects. One is from by the Tamazit Women Movement, as Robin has mentioned, and that is um, called Violence Outside the Battlefield. And the idea behind it was that as a, as a society that's been in civil war, more or less, for the past 10 years, we have been desensitized to violence. We see all these images and videos, sometimes in real life, of battles, of, of armed conflicts, of bombings, of destroyed buildings, and we become so used to it. I mean, people now, when you talk to them, um, they would ask you how many people died, not who died, because it's it doesn't become an issue of the value in itself, it becomes how bad it is basically as an impact. And we wanted to talk about all the other violence that happened, uh, the women who are displaced and then don't have, have access to go to universities and schools, they are, um, they ha are restricted in movement, uh, the women who would have to de deal with um, returned uh, soldiers who are mostly having severe PTSD cases and could be you know, exposed to all sorts of things, uh, widows, um, women who are no longer 
um, having any other family members who would support them. And so now they are the head of households. We wanted to show, um, you know, how Libyans are degraded and removed and their dignity is destroyed by this war economy that makes them queue in front of banks for days, sometimes losing their lives in the process. Uh, all these Libyans who would be without power for like 20 hours or even more. And we didn't want us as an organization to lecture the community about it. I mean, we are from the community, so of course we could speak about it. But what we did is an open call for everyone, artist or not artist, to send us texts, words, pictures, videos of other violence that they see. And it's a way to um, use art, which is, I think, has always been an, an, an eternal tool for human beings to tell stories or to um, highlight a grievance and it's for them it's a way to engage all of the public who are interested to, th to think about the issue in itself so it's it's again it's a very much dynamic uh, process um the other project by uh, the Khalifa Ila it, is specifically um, a preservation of us of a destroyed um, an erased history and culture uh, that the war is not doing any better for it. And now with COVID, it's it's um, it's even worse with our elders, you know, dying and passing away. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to document the rituals and traditions uh, of women and men um, in 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 uh, in the Amazigh, in Amazigh community, but through um, the thing that we love the most, <laughs> which is food. So um, food that is gathered collectively, cooked collectively, um, how, how, what did, do people do? I mean, for instance, women, when uh, making couscous, they usually sing. They have specific tools, they do it together. And so that's what we wanted to also document. Um, and hopefully in, in the book that we want to publish, um, highlight that um, that all of these things that we do together as a community um, could reconcile us around a lot of our issues. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Asma. We'll just follow on straight into our next presentation. Ruth, if you'd like to begin. Sure. Thank you so much. Asma, that was an amazing presentation. So yeah, a lot of what you said really resonated with me. So thank you for thank you for that. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Ruth. And um, I'm from an organisation called In Place of War. I believe that we have a presentation. Yeah, there it is. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit about In Place of War and then hand over to a colleague who'll give some of her reflections. Um, but just to give you an idea of what our organisation does. So we're a global organisation that uses artistic creativity in places of conflict as a tool for positive social change. So we work with a network of over 100 grassroots change makers in music, theatre and across the arts to transform cultures of violence and suffering into hope, opportunity and freedom and to improve people's livelihoods and opportunity. Um, next slide. So yeah, so we work across a number of different types of conflict zones. So we work in four different kind of settings in war zones, places of post-war, gang war and political oppression. Um, next slide. I think we might have to skip a couple here. And then on to the next one, please. Okay, so a lot of the time we're, we're asked why art? And I guess we have to quite continually fight um, for our position because art is not maybe as understood um, as other kind of forms of um, peacekeeping and you know community development, etc. And I just want to make re read a quote from a colleague um, that I interviewed for our book recently. He's called Laurent and he's based in the DRC. And he said, art helps people forget about the conflict. Art helps you change your perceptions about others. With art, you can call on people's emotions. And with art, you can create dreams. You can disconnect from the bad things around you and imagine a different world. And I just thought that's really profound. Art has these kind of multifaceted kind of um, purposes in terms of helping people away from conflict and to create you know, positive futures and opportunity. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of the history of In Place of War, we've been around for the past 16 years. We started in 2004 at the University of Manchester as a major research project led by Professor James Thompson. Um, and over that time, we kind of became very well networked and connected to a kind of global uh, community of what we call change makers, people living and working in communities, predominantly young people aged between 18 and 34, who were using all sorts of different art forms to make lasting change at the grassroots in their communities. And then as we sort of kind of connected people um, and developed networks, we then started to understand how we could potentially be useful to our change makers to help them amplify the impact of their work. Um, so I'm going to now talk about the different things that we do within In Place of War. So next slide, please. So essentially, In Place of War supports our network of change makers with three things. The first is around the development and creation of cultural spaces. So these are artistic spaces based in communities that engage people away from conf conflicts using different art forms. It could be theatre, music, dance, food, all sorts of different elements. And we help to create these spaces. We, we have a network of cultural spaces around the world of about 120 called Nafasi, which means space in Swahili. Um, and we help to create or co-create spaces in Soweto, South Africa, in Uganda and in Palestine. Um, the second kind of pillar of In Place of War's work is around education and entrepreneurship. So we have now five education programmes within In Place of War, certified by the University of Manchester. And they're very alternative in their approach. They are have been driven by uh, our membership, our network membership. So they're very much kind of examples of entrepreneurship from Africa, the Middle East, Latin America. And they aim to help people kind of be inspired and produce uh, create and set up businesses in communities that face conflict to try and help kind of generate opportunity um, and improve livelihoods. And the third thing we do is around artistic cultivation and collaboration, which is about providing global platforms with for, the, for those with the most marginalised voices in the world um, to tell their stories using the arts as the mechanism to do that. So we work, for example, with women artists from places of conflict, and we have a band called Girl, G-R-R-R-L, which brings together women from lots of different places who form a band together and tell their stories and their challenges, the challenges they face using music as the mechanism to do that. And we've helped to kind of showcase that work to uh, millions of people across the world. Next slide, please. So yeah, in terms of how we work, um, we have a couple of tools that help us. So um, first is our change maker network. We have an incredibly active network of over 100 change makers located across 26 countries. And these are people who are, I would I would say, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of describe, I would describe them as community leaders, people who can galvanize their communities, people right in there at the grassroots who are using real innovative approaches to make change. And then the second thing is around research and advocacy. So it's about us making a case for the arts as a mechanism for change and really trying to demonstrate that impact so that we can, you know, we can help our grassroots networks receive more support, more resources, etc. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide really just shows the sorts, the sorts of places that we work. So primarily, like I said before, across Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. And we work with, like I said, this incredible network of young, young change makers, many of whom we've worked with for over a decade and beyond. Um, yep, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly touch on what we've been doing during uh, the times of COVID before I hand over to Teresa. So, COVID was kind of a game changer for all of us uh, across the globe, but more, I think more so for our communities that are already facing challenges on their every day in terms of the conflict they face, the consequences of that conflict, and then add in a layer of, you know, a global health crisis. Um, so I just talk briefly about what our change makers did and what we did. On to the next slide, please. So yeah, so we the COVID hit and the the, lock, the first lockdown kind of came into, into place across the world. So as an organisation, we set up bi-weekly Zoom calls for our change maker network so they could share what was happening on the ground in their communities. And what was really interesting is that 
None of our communities talked about um, COVID, the virus itself, but they referred more to the consequences of lockdown, meaning people couldn't go to work, meaning people were facing starvation in communities that were not historically used to facing these kind of challenges. So we set up a fund, we worked with the music industry, we raised a bunch of money, and we supported 40 organizations across 25 countries with small grants, helping them to do things and use their creativity in remarkable ways. So this is Ralph, he's based in the Cape Flats. He set up 10 community kitchens and has produced hundreds of thousands of meals for his community. Normally he'd be doing ballet with young people there. So he pivoted and, and set up something completely new. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then inspired by this model in South Africa, a group of hip hop um, hip hop makers, a hip hop collective in Medellin, Colombia, set up a community kitchen after they connected with Ralph and learned about his process. And they're making hundreds of meals every week. Next slide, please. We help to protect an indigenous tribe um, in the Amazon, who we work with a, an indigenous filmmaker there. And again, it was about ensuring that no one had to leave the community so that nobody contracted COVID. Next slide, please. And then finally, we worked with an organization called Tina El Fuerte in Caracas, who set up um, something called Radio Vedura, which was a mobile sound system, driving around the streets of Caracas, playing music, reading messages from loved ones to help people who were stuck in kind of isolated in tower blocks feel less isolated. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a photograph of that work. Hi. Um... I am so happy to hear what Ruth and Asma had to say. It's I'm sitting here trying not to nod very hard, but yeah, I completely agree. So um, I'll just give an overview of what we've been doing. When I say we, I'm deliberately using we because all of the projects are co-designed. All of the work is done in in partnership. Next slide, please. So I'm looking at the research that takes into account the visual and material cultures of regions. So deliberately working in conflict areas because I belong to one. Um, from I am from Kashmir myself, and using cultural mapping to understand how communities of women across of, across all these contexts of war that I have worked in rely on knowledge that they have, which is coded, uncoded, tacit, yet it only comes to value when we start probing a little bit in conversations over tea. Uh, this knowledge is very important because it holds a key to understanding peace building and what peace means in these communities and to understand where the aspirations of these communities lie. So next slide, please. Uh, so what you will see as I speak is a series of images from a range of places that I have worked in, which I will list at the end of the presentation, but these are just to make you understand the remoteness of locations. There's a yak there somewhere. I don't think you can see it. There's a little black stone that, that is actually a yak. Um, and I will not talk about these images. If you have questions about them, I can tell you later. So this research looks at research for development in conflict zones that uses arts-based approaches and presents a unique mix of challenges, both for methods and across overall research design. But I'm just gonna rattle off a list of words which come to us as researchers but absolutely lose context when you translate them back into the languages that we have to speak. So the list of challenges include poverty, inequality that addressed the GCRF had that and that fits most of the projects I've worked on. Inequality, inequity, conflict, risk, death, injury, trauma. Then there are the whole body of work around ethics of research, what you can and cannot do, what you should and should not do, what should make you feel guilty, the notion of power, in its broadest, broadest sense and what it means around knowledge. Um, and then the embedded systems that Asma also talked about, which normalize this inequality, they normalize the violence, desensitize you to what's happening around you, and you become an observer in your own space as a part participant or whatever you want to call them. Just, I'll flag the word participant here. Participant translated into Urdu translates to hissedar. Hissa means share, dar means holder. So our participants see themselves as hissedar. They see themselves as, as shareholders of the project. At no point of time are they seen as participants or people we bring together to discuss something and off we go to write what we want to write. So 
these participants have access to media. There's, uh, you know, there's notions of globalization that they understand, mobile enabled, uh, internet enabled phones that allows them to understand the inequality, but also the, the depth of inequality that they address. And then there's this whole thing around this whole body of work around landscapes and nature and natural resources, how they, the relationship they have with their own environment, which brings forth on concepts of, you know, knowledge and belief and feelings and emotions, which are all very, very useful lenses that arts-based approaches effectively captures or enables you to process through. There is this notion of generational violence, which Asma Adir uh, addressed, and I will not go further into that. But that notion of, I live in a conflict setting, but also I lost my brother, but also I'm putting my child in the bus and he may never, never come back. That precarity of existence that becomes normalized till they have any luxury of time to sit and reflect on these practices, which is where art-based approaches come in. And I specifically work with women, so all my projects are around. You will very rarely see a man in any of those images. If there is a man, he's probably carrying heavy cameras for us. But <laughs> so gendered approaches to work. But there is um, these women bear the double burden of conflict and remoteness of their location, but also the burden of their identity, which is gendered and has religious connotations to its understanding and the limitations attached to that. So most of the work has used methods that are um, Arts-based methods, which are participatory, not so much performative, but looking at ethnography, participant observations, and other qualitative methods, which don't quite cut through the barriers that exist of understanding these embodied practices. So generally, participatory methods, which are art-based, look at research as an active engagement with a changing social world rather than a static reality, which is fair enough. But in conflict spaces, Static reality is not an option. The conflict changes its face, its manifestation, its power dynamics on an almost hourly, if not a daily basis. So there is no one approach in the arts-based kit of things available to you to use that address the shifting dynamics of a conflict. And the only thing that this work then rests upon is is the experience of the participation. Every participant workshop, every partnership, every conversation, every workshop, focus group, interview has been transformative in both directions. For me and the team who works, who I work with to understand things that are not quite mentioned, but also the dialogue, the exchange, the learning, the discussions around discomfort, the agony of existence, Yet also they kind of bring forward ideas of, of hope and aspiration of absolute resilience, which is impossible to define or even put a measure or descriptor to the extreme resilience, as we like to call it, but the extreme ability to keep going despite and in spite of the circumstances you find yourself in. And these workshops have highlighted, every workshop I have done in the past two decades has highlighted this absolutely intimidating ability of women to come forth, engage in arts-based approaches and practices that allow them to make what they value. And all these images of craft products and just keep persevering in their, in their ability to keep going on this. And yet also each, each hissedar in this research has has emo has emotions that have been captured only as a sense of loss in English. At the end of each workshop, I have always been told to abandon my family and just stay with them and not return to my own home, which has been which has been unusual as it has run across most workshops that I have worked with and most focus groups. But going back to the arts as a mode of inquiry. The non-verbal component in this practice that uh, we explored through creative practices of culture and craft and craft making and handcrafted products has the ability not only to bridge the divide between conflict and culture and globalization and gender inequalities and all the words that I listed at the start, but it also has the ability to pr promote notions of healing, of identity, of dignity, of 
pushing back against the degradation of every of the everyday that you experience as living in a conflict zone and it also brings forward a an attempt at creative empowerment and empowerment here doesn't mean capacity building empowerment here means knowledge exchange these women who i have worked with have extremely deep knowledge deep wide vast ridiculously high levels of understanding of their environment of their practice of who they are what they do why they do it and what it means to them they might not necessarily articulate it in english or any other language that loses its meaning and translation the minute you start imposing these words on it but their their understanding of who they are and what their pehchan is what is their id what is what is it that defines them as who they are is what they make and the embodied practices that we work with also then lead to these these projects being co-produced to a point where this image in front of you is an exhibition that was put up and it led to innovation in the at the levels of unorthodox ideas where i co-production is going so far but then when you start challenging orthodox views around what innovation and what research and partnership and art based approaches mean because it's a two way system then you start being thrown into the deep ends of this is a nice in interesting exhibition and we are doing it in pakistan why can we not do this in london you say you live in london do it in london let people know about our work H how can you push back it's a partnership you said you would like to do this work and you would like to do it together and this is what comes out of it and then the partner as asma said the partner co designs that research and the partner said this is not enough you want me, we want this to be done there and i said will you come no no we can't come but we trust you you do this and let us know how it goes to the point where it becomes a push and pull and there are unorthodox ways of doing research if you add an exhibition at the end of a grant proposal saying we did this and oh by the way we also did this it doesn't quite square with the funders in most cases you generally have every single penny accounted for and so how do you push these notions without embedding the design of the project right at the start but that also is presupposed i am assuming that this work will lead to an exhibition they want to do an exhibition but once they've seen one exhibition of their own work on the wall why should we be holding back on where their ambitions and desire and desires take them um it also challenges this work also challenges the uh, the agendas around knowledge production and power within the creative sector this is an issue anyway but when we work within the creative informal sector it becomes a major issue uh, to understand who owns designs who can use them who can copy them how can they be sold entrepreneurship all those kind of ideas get questioned and then the question of the space that this practice creates of having conversations around peace i was told at one point of time that we are not waiting for her peace is equivalent to her we are going to keep doing what we need to do you will tell us how to do this we will do this together and when she will come she will come this decentralized approach to research which is absolutely essential for any research that looks at equitability as a core principle is a driving point that uses arts based approaches in a perfect combination of decentralized approach to uh, to research and impact in the pandemic and i will quickly cover the pandemic in the pandemic we have had to acknowledge our constrained position as researchers we have had to understand that we live in the uncertainty of the everyday that the pandemic brings and the project is self regulated by those who own this project with us and therefore in the pandemic we have not had much trouble doing any research uh in these places that we are doing research and i have done research before that's on your screen and that is reaffirming in many ways art based approaches the decentralized approach and the co-production approach to uh, producing research and generating research and transforming lives in the pandemic does not shift because it is not owned by any of us but it's a collective enterprise which only art based approaches can provide us i shall stop there thank you very much That's fantastic. Thank you so much Neelam. Thanks for that. I think we found Teresa. We're going to have a quick 2 minutes 
a sort of distilled uh, version of what Teresa was going to say, just to make sure that we keep to time as much as possible and leave some time open for discussion. So Teresa, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a, a couple of points around um, our, our methodologies and approaching um, our work with communities. So we, as Ruth said, we only really support um, communities that, um, where projects have been devised and developed by communities. Normally people who've experienced um, violence, either as victims or perpetrators of the violence. Um, and this is part of our attempts, and I say attempts because, you know, nothing's perfect and we're trying um, to decolonialize knowledge. And I think our education programs are a good examples of that. So they've been certified by a university, but interestingly, none of the knowledge within the programs or the ideas within the programs come from academic study. So this is our way as as kind of an organization within the Global North, how we can facilitate knowledge exchange between um, communities within the Global South. And we've seen that um, through this, organizations in, in Colombia have, have adopted model, adopted and also adapted models from, um, from Brazil or from South Africa or from Uganda. Um, and it's about then being able to embed these programs as well. So in terms of sustainability, um, the, pro the projects are embedded within these organizations. So we are an intermediary and we work with intermediaries within those communities. And um, so they are able to respond, they're more agile and um, they understand the local conditions, um, which enables, I think, projects to be more sustainable. Um, and just quickly covering that um, aspect of sustainability and maybe innovation, we were able to innovate through COVID, through those um, public donations that we received, um, you know, a funder would never have allowed us to just give money to groups of, of um, to organizations in communities and, and say, do what you want with the money. But we have a long standing trusted relationship with those organizations and we knew that they would use the resource in a way that was the most appropriate to the community. And, and through that, we found that by giving a thousand dollars to an organization in South Africa, they now have a, sustain, a sustainable um, business. They've set up a bakery. So they set it up initially as, a, as an initial response to COVID, but now that's become a sustainable business. So it's generating employment. Um, we supported in Colombia organizations, um, so enabling students to have access to computers during lockdown because you know they couldn't continue their studies. So I think that's the main, the kind of main takeaway from all of this is around building long, um, long-term sustainable partnerships um, built on trust and an understanding and an equal part, as equal as it can be. Bearing in mind that obviously we're the ones that are able to articulate. Um, and navigate funding processes and the ones that probably have the three year you know set of accounts and all of the hurdles that come with trying to access funding um or just language skills you know we're working on a proposal with colombian partners and um, and the proposal has to be in english so straight away they can't they can't write the proposal so we are automatically the lead partners so it just kind of a, a, a good example of some of the challenges and the practicalities around funding um that organizations face and the structures in which they operate in Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all our panelists for your fantastic presentations. Um, we're running a little short on time. So what I want to do is uh, throw discussion open to the floor to see if we have any initial questions that we can field. I'll give everyone a minute to think on that. And then we can jump straight into our discussion. I see we have a raised hand. Hi, Stuart, go for it. Hi, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, th thanks for the presentations. Three really interesting presentations there. and links really nicely to the next couple of weeks, I think. So some key terms that I took away were co-produced research, decentralized research, which I've not heard before. Thanks for that, Neil. I think that's a, a really useful term. Uh, decolonizing knowledge. I guess my question is, um, in terms of what the research brings, what has changed on the ground beyond the participants that took part in the actual projects? And what insights are there that are generalizable beyond those particular projects? So I'm not thinking so much about the impact on participants, but what the research has brought and what's been demonstrated that can be beyond those projects. Otherwise, we have the classic issue, don't we, around arts humanities projects of being small scale and are not reproducible. Thank you. Great, thanks. Asma, would you like to begin? <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> well, I'll give uh, one example from uh, from a. Uh, uh, 
a, a, a research that we've done in part of a four-year project uh, we created where the NGOs uh, have done the interviews and we're trained to to do that um, what the what the experience and the results have uh, contributed to is their own initiatives which the project also supported so their uh, projects or initiatives have been informed by the research that they've done um, and their first-hand experience with survivors and, 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 and whatnot. So it, the aim was from the beginning that they would use this knowledge to further their work. Great, thanks. Uh, Neelam, Teresa, would you like to add or expand? Just a sentence, I think, then uh, the research through communities which are partners, they allow them to have dialogues with each other across geopolitical divides sometimes. And the work kind of translates across the borders. And then you have people engaging with you rather than you looking for them. And that scalability is quite interesting. If the if the if research is communicated through communities of practice within their own spaces, the word travels faster than any other journal you can write an impact statement to. Teresa, anything to add uh, to that? Yeah, I think um, in Colombia, the, the hip hop um, models are quite interesting in terms of kind of scalability and also this idea of decolonizing knowledge. And I think that's particularly relevant, maybe in a Latin American context anyway, because um, it's very much embedded in this idea of popular education. Um, and so that kind of um, horizontal way of working anyway. Um, but in that in that sense, we're seeing in the case of Colombia, this model has been replicated um, and been recognised by um, the national government as as kind of a, a means of engaging with young people who are at risk of violence. Um, and I think hip hop in particular works in that way. Um, and you see it again across the world. Hip hop, you think about its origins as well, being um, from New York in the late seventies and engaging young people. I think this is a way of I don't like to use the word empowerment, but it is a way of, of of people having knowledge and sharing knowledge in a way and developing skills in a way that is scalable. And I think it's particularly scalable in communities where young people um, are either in kind of deprived areas or from low socioeconomic backgrounds or in suffering um, the effects of conflict from particularly things like structural inequality, because it doesn't require a lot of resource, but it's also something that's quite cool. Um, but the origins of hip hop, so it can engage young people and it and it's about creating a space um, where you can challenge kind of the normalization of violence. And I know um, that others have touched on that as well in the in the panel. Um, and I think in particular in a Latin American context where violence is very much um, youth kind of a youth phenomena, particularly a male youth phenomena, um, you can find that hip hop can replicate some of those last masculine local masculine versions of sorry, local versions of masculinity um, through hip hop. And you see that, right, you've, you know, you've seen that, I think it's a scalable thing that you can certainly compare with maybe hip hop in North Africa, hip hop in, in Latin America, hip hop in, in the United States or in UK, the UK as well. Um, hello, every, the, 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 there were really fascinating conversation, uh, fascinating presentations. Thanks so much for that. Um, I want to kind of pick up on Stuart's question and then also feed that in to some of the stuff that you were saying, um, Asma, about what, what in the literature we talk about is downward accountability, I suppose, isn't it? About making making projects not only designed, but also accountable to their, their kind of end users, their participants, and making that then drive the drive a change in the other parts of the kind of project value chain, if you like. And I wondered if that's something that you've seen. Have you seen how your approach to developing these kinds of projects has impacted on the way that NGOs, CSOs, etc., have operated in the regions, in the in the places where you work, and now because that's another way that we can kind of see that you know that that sort of your participatory action research ethos feeds into changing the kind of structures of development. And I wondered if you had any examples, or if anyone else has got any examples of how by 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 stamping your foot and for and and uh, insisting that the young people that you're working with are at the center of the project and not only in the center of design but also in the center of all the parts of the of of, of the research process has that then see have you seen any changes in practice or changes in the way that other organizations interact with you yes it's um well i wouldn't say a complete change but there is 
I mean, I think what's sometimes also annoys me a little bit that humans tend to exceptionalize. So while they might agree to my approach, they might not do the same with others. So I don't see it as mainstream, if you want to call it, or 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 uh, employed everywhere. But I think COVID this year will change that because the um, overall Libya was very difficult to work in to begin with. So international organizations or donors and funders always needed Libyans because they're the only ones who could do it. Um, but now with COVID, it's going to also diminish even more the accessibility to the communities. And here, sometimes I've, I've posed in other events the questions. I'm like, well, now you have you've known all these resources, you've invested in all these people. It's now that you actually reflect that on your next year, on what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with all these people who's been trained, who have skills? Um, even if not, all these people have knowledge, experience of, of their own projects. Um, there is also um, um, a factor of of um, well, for 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 CSOs who um, rely basically on funding, and because in Libya you don't have co-funding, you have only funding for initiatives and small projects, so it's limited as well in terms of what what kind of um, money you could do with. There is an an intimidation factor, I think, of losing the support that you have, of losing an organization that you, you have. So, and that's where I spoke earlier about the power relation, right? Um, to be be aware and reflective of your position when working with other people, because you could be very well ha holding their livelihoods in your hands and and with unwittingly completely subserving them in a process where they should be the one who are doing it. So, I think um, youth or youth led organizations do not either have to ex sometimes the experience or the um the the awareness of if i stomp my foot will it will i be rejected and i have been rejected before it's not like everyone agrees with me not at all i have been rejected before and 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 it made a lot of my work voluntary where i have to actually pay for my, for, for the work from my other jobs that i do to maintain my independence because someone else could always do it right so it also needs us as activists overall to have this conversation where we we'll all agree to stomp a foot. Because if we all do it, same as with any power, if we all do it, the power will have to relent. Um, but so that's that's uh, that would hopefully be a conversation that will happen within a global challenges research fund. We embed the concept of equitability front and center of everything that we fund and do, and uh, any further devolved funding inside a pot also needs to look at that equitability to move forward. And I think that is extremely important in the, everything that we do and everything that you are doing. So which is why I was nodding with happiness when you were saying this, like, yes, please, this is the way to go forward. Great. Well, let's move on to our next question. It's in the chat box at the bottom of your screen from a buyer who says, while co-producing the knowledge, decolonizing knowledge, has the language of research changed because of the participants? Or does the research still hold on to the master's language as Audre Lord would term patriarchal language? Leelam, do you want to start us off with that, seeing as I think your your mic is still on? Uh, the language has changed, Abhaya. The, um, the language of research, and which is why all these buzz was in the sustainability, inclusive piece, inclusive this, inclusive... Um, gender mainstreaming, all these kind of new buzzwords that drive donor priorities and research priorities seem to hit a blank wall when you have, um, yeah, when you're co-producing knowledge because they become almost common sense and common knowledge from the, from the on the ground partner's perspective. If you don't include me in what you are designing, this is not going to work, being common sense on that end so the language changes and if based on what gcrf was i was talking about the language changes in the research because the research becomes equitably designed um the master's language not so much and i don't think it exists in any of the work that i do um writing however as dissemination as outputs 
still has that hold. We still go down the linear path of objective, neutral, non-emotional reporting, writing uh, on behalf of others uh, because it's in English and because journals expect a certain style of writing. And I would extend that to how our research is judged and evaluated as well. It's very flat. Uh, there's a question that, that I had from listening to our three presentations. I was fascinated, Asma, about how the, you are articulating the sort of pitfalls of supposed, uh, you know, neutrality and objectivity. That's something that's seen as a goal. And, you know, you sort of push back against that, speaking about how that's often impossible and sometimes not actually something we should be aiming for. I wonder if all of our panelists could maybe just reflect on, on those kind of challenges. I know, Neelam, you also mentioned in your presentation this idea of the, the, the kind of repeat traumas and the kind of the way you, that you position yourself within your research communities. And I think that's a, it's a really important thing to tease out, especially, you know, this is kind of the kind of things we'll be discussing in our self-reflexivity session also. But I wonder if you could all just perhaps reflect a bit more on the kind of benefits and challenges to objectivity and a deeply embedded uh, long-term and sustainable relationship within the communities that you all work with. Perhaps I can just talk a bit about how we work with our the people we work with on the ground. So for us, our, the, the, our kind of local contacts and partners are key to everything that we are as an organisation. So it's that network of, of change makers that drive what we do as an organisation, how we support those, those people and that we're working with. And really, it's kind of their insights and knowledge that drives everything that we do. Um, the, we, you know, um, most recently, I think, as Asma said, you know, it's about putting those people in positions to be able to make decisions as well. So we added our change makers to our uh, to our UK board. Um, and so really just involving them in, in a more kind of decision making capacity around what we do. So for us, it's kind of we're acting on behalf of those those that network and those people and kind of sort of striving to do to help them increase the impact and give them the tools and, and resources and connections, etc, that they need to be able to do that. So for us, it's them that drive everything that we do. And I think it's the long term relationship that we've had with those networks and those those individuals um, that have helped us gain insight into what's happening at a community level in those places. And um, because obviously we're working across 26 countries and multiple communities and it's incredibly complex. And, we, you know, it's very difficult to understand the dynamics within a community if you're not from there. So really, it's about other people's insights and knowledge and us supporting those people that we trust to deliver amazing work. Just to add to the the long term relationship, the relationships are not driven by me. The relationships are driven by them, and I don't disappear when a project or a grant finishes. They are practically family. Their kids play with my kid when I am there with my kid. It's it's difficult to extract yourself out of a project and then start doing something else. The geographic disparity exists. If I'm working in Iraq and not in Kashmir. It is different, but within Kashmir, they will know that long-term relationship is established because it's an equal relationship. It's like your friend on Facebook who knows what you are doing and you see what they are doing. So the relationship works differently. In terms of the objectivity, I think what Asma was saying was spot on. It's not possible. It's not possible to be objective in places of conflict. It's possible to be rational and reasonable within limits. Uh, but more than objective, I think it's about managing expectations on both ends. Uh, and that might be the closest you can get to objectivity, I think. I don't know. Great. Thanks, Neelam. Asma, any final thoughts from you before we wrap up? I loved what uh, Neelam said about how embedded you would be in the process. And, and uh, I agree. I mean, um, not only that it's important for me that I stay in touch with people that I work with or train or or that I continue to um, to talk but it's it's inspiring and it's actually a drive for my work when one of the young people would message me and say you know remember what you've we've talked about the other day I want to make this and this and can I consult you on this or can I speak to you about this and it's um it's it, it often is it's much it, it 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 fills me with so much joy it's much better than doing the project itself because not only that um 
not only that this person is impacted, but this person is finding the agency to do something about it. Um, and including me in that is an, an immense privilege, but also in the hardest of times, because it's very difficult to work in a conflict setting and maintain um, and maintain the drive and maintain the, especially when you get embroiled with, you know, mental health issues and whatnot, it's super hard to continue to work sometimes over the years. But what they give me a lot of the time is that, well, even if sometimes I think I can, I will, I want to quit and it, I can't, if these young people who have only, only ever known war can still find it in themselves to fight and want to do something, then I'm not allowed to give up. Um, thanks. Oh, thanks, Esma, on that inspirational note. I just want to thank all of our speakers for joining us here this evening. And thank you for a wonderful discussion, fruitful engagement. And I would like to invite you all to join us for our film screening. You can see the link, direct link to the film screening in the chat box. If you click on the chat, the text chat, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be able to link back through there. Otherwise, just return straight to the conference website click on the cultural program and you'll be able to join us at our film screening there. So we're going to wrap up this room. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks again to our discussants and we'll see you shortly. Thanks everyone. <laughs>